This series is about the territorial dispute over the area widely known as the West Bank. In the first two parts we considered whether Israel acquired control of it by means of aggression, and whether Israel has any rights to the land under international law. Those are both secular perspectives on the dispute. But as Christian friends of Israel, we believe that another perspective is even more important, the biblical perspective. More important because we believe the Holy Bible to be the word of God, as stated by the Apostle Paul when he wrote, all scripture is God breathed. If we turn to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis and chapter 12, we find God speaking to Abraham saying, leave your country and go to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you, you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who treats you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Five chapters later, God adds another promise. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God to you and to your offspring after you. I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land where you are travelling, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. Turning to chapter 26, we find God confirming that promise to Abraham's son Isaac. Live in this land and I will be with you and will bless you, for I will give to you and to your offspring all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And two chapters later again, further confirmation to Isaac's son Jacob. I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. I will give the land you lie on to you and to your offspring. In you and in your offspring all the families of the earth will be blessed. Thus around 2080 BC, that is 4100 years ago, God promised to bless all the families on earth through Abraham and promised to give him and his descendants the land of Canaan. God confirmed the promise about the land to the son of promise, Isaac, and then confirmed both promises to one of Isaac's twin sons, Jacob, the one whom God himself renamed Israel. More than 400 years later, God spoke in detail through Moses, after the exodus from slavery in Egypt. When the Israelites had spent 40 years in the wilderness, they were told of future blessings and curses as described in the book of Deuteronomy. All these blessings will come upon you if you listen to the Lord your God's voice. You shall be blessed in the city and you shall be blessed in the field. You shall be blessed when you come in and you shall be blessed when you go out. But if you will not listen to the Lord your God's voice, you will be cursed in the city and you will be cursed in the field. You will be cursed when you come in and you will be cursed when you go out. The Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. Among these nations you will find no ease. Thus, even before the Israelites had entered the Promised Land, God warned that disobedience would lead to them being scattered all around the world, unable to find ease among other nations. But God went on to say through Moses, When all these things have come on you, and you shall call them to mind among all the nations, and return to the Lord your God, then the Lord your God will return and gather you from all the peoples, the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed. He will do you good and increase your numbers more than your fathers. So, around 1440 BC, God spoke clearly through Moses about future actions once the Israelites had entered the Promised Land. He would scatter the nation when they disobeyed him, but also gather them again when they turned back to him. Roughly 400 years after speaking through Moses, the kingdom of Israel had been established under Jesse's son, David, and God spoke to him through the prophet Nathan. 
I took you from the sheep pen, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people, over Israel. I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, that they may dwell in their own place and be moved no more. The children of wickedness will not afflict them any more, as at first and as from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. But God later spoke to David's son Solomon, after he had built and dedicated the temple, warning about the danger of the people being exiled. If you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck them up by the roots out of my land which I have given them. And this house which I have made holy for my name, I will cast out of my sight. And I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. This would happen if the Israelites turned away from God. History reveals that after Solomon's reign, Israel divided into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom soon turned away from God and was dispersed into exile by the conquering Assyrians. The southern kingdom survived longer, but was warned of the danger again. Yet before their exile to Babylon, God spoke about a future return through the prophet Isaiah in around 711 BC, saying, I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will tell the north, give them up, and tell the south, don't hold them back. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Almost 100 years later, around 609 BC, Jeremiah prophesied that the eventual return would be greater than the nation's exodus from Egypt. Behold, the days come that it will no more be said, as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the countries where he had driven them. So the prophesied return would be both numerous and widespread. After the Exodus, the Book of Numbers listed 603,550 Israelite men plus 22,000 Levites. That suggests roughly one and a quarter million adult Israelites crossed the Red Sea giving a possible total of around two and a half million people, including children. But chapter two of the book of Ezra indicates fewer than 50,000 Jews returned from Babylon around the year 537 BC. So that return did not match the scale of Jeremiah's prophecy. However, since 1892, Jews have returned to Israel from more than 84 different nations. The total number is reported to be more than three and a half million, most of them returning since the modern state of Israel declared independence in 1948. This number exceeds the scale of the exodus from Egypt and therefore matches Jeremiah's prophecy. Surprisingly, God explained why he would bring the Jews back to the land of Israel, speaking through the prophet Ezekiel around 585 BC, he said, I scattered them among the nations. Where they went, they profaned my holy name, in that men said of them, These are the Lord's people, and have left his land. The nations will know that I am the Lord, when I am proven holy in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations, and gather you out of all the countries, and will bring you into your own land. God's reason for the return is to prove that he is holy. If he left the Jews scattered among the nations of the world, he would have abandoned his covenant with Abraham, which he himself declared to be an everlasting covenant. This makes it very puzzling that many church leaders believe the modern return of the Jewish people to Israel has nothing to do with biblical prophecies and God's eternal plan. Some teach that the church has replaced the Jews in God's plan, but what about breaking an eternal covenant? Others claim that all the promises made to the Jewish people have been fulfilled in Christ. But a return to the land? How was that already fulfilled? By the time of the exile in Babylon, 
Four major prophets had spoken of a return to the promised land after a period of exile. Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They were not the only ones to prophesy such a return. Around 840 BC, Obadiah said the Israelites will possess the field of Ephraim and the field of Samaria. Around 770 BC, Amos declared God's plan, saying, I will bring my people Israel back from captivity and they will rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. Hosea said in around 730 BC, the children of Judah and the children of Israel will be gathered together. God also spoke through Micah in around 720 BC saying, I will assemble that which is lame and I will gather that which is driven away and that which I have afflicted. Almost a hundred years later, Zephaniah said, At that time I will bring you in, and at that time I will gather you, for I will give you honour and praise among all the peoples. In around 470 BC, after the return from Babylon, God also spoke through Zechariah, saying, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them, and they will dwell within Jerusalem. All of this led English scholar Thomas Brightman to write of the Jews, Shall they return to Jerusalem again? There is nothing more certain. The prophets do everywhere confirm it and beat upon it. When preaching before the House of Commons in 1649, John Owen spoke of the bringing home of his ancient people to be one fold with the fullness of the Gentiles in answer to millions of prayers put up at the throne of grace for this very glory in all generations. John Wesley, co-founder of the Methodist Church, stated in his notes on the letter to the Romans, so many prophecies refer to this grand event that it is surprising any Christian can doubt of it. And these are greatly confirmed by the wonderful preservation of the Jews as a distinct people to this day. Church of Scotland minister Robert Murray McShane preached in Dundee that the greatest glory and joy anyone can experience is to be like God and to care first for the Jews is to be like God. The whole Bible shows that God has a special affection for Israel. There are some, of course, who will say that God has finished with Israel, but the whole Bible contradicts such an idea. Did God reject his people? By no means. Famous Baptist preacher C.H. Spurden said in a Christmas sermon, The day shall yet come when the Jews, who were the first apostles to the Gentiles, the first missionaries to us who were far off, shall be gathered in again. Until that shall be, the fullness of the church's glory can never come. Matchless benefits to the world are bound up with the restoration of Israel. Their gathering in shall be as life from the dead. Preaching around the same time as Spurgeon, Bishop J.C. Ryle of the Church of England said, It is high time for Christians to interpret unfulfilled prophecy by the light of prophecies already fulfilled. The curses on the Jews were brought to pass literally, so also will be the blessings. The scattering was literal, so also will be the gathering. The pulling down of Zion was literal, so also will be the building up. The rejection of Israel was literal, so also will be the restoration. These church leaders are just a sample from a significant consensus. It is high time that 21st century Christians interpreted the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel as an ongoing fulfilment of many relevant Bible prophecies. God is taking the Jewish people back. Israel's sovereignty over territory is not a manner of annexation, it is restoration.